Sometimes cracking a cold case involves reviewing the DNA evidence, and sometimes it involves remembering a random detail from one of the most acclaimed TV shows of all time. In September 2023, authorities in Marietta, Georgia were finally able to put to rest a mystery that had haunted the area for five decades. In January 1972, nine-year-old Debbie Lynn Randall remained behind at a laundromat after her stepfather went home for the evening. She then vanished without a trace. Two weeks later, her body was found far from home, and leads in the case quickly dried up. Fortunately, the Marietta Police Department had done an exemplary job of obtaining and preserving evidence collected from the scene. This helped them identify the killer as William Rose, who was 24 at the time of the crime and died by suicide in 1974. Familial DNA was used to pinpoint him with cooperation from his family. Cold case investigator Morris Nix offered a postscript to the case by noting, Technology does not get old, it doesn't retire, it doesn't get sick, and it doesn't quit. Technology was seeking William Rose, and it found him in the grave. In 1981, 23-year-old hairdressing student Laura Kempton was found killed in her Portsmouth, New Hampshire apartment. At the time, DNA evidence was collected from the scene, but it was only able to determine that the perpetrator was a man. But thanks to the tireless efforts of law enforcement and a meticulous re-evaluation of the evidence using modern genetic technology, the decades-old DNA profile finally identified the killer as Ronnie James Lee. He was an Army veteran who served prison time in the late 80s for burglary and sexual assault. He died of a drug overdose in 2005. Kempton's surviving family issued a statement praising investigators that said, Their diligence and determination, along with extraordinary personal commitment over the past decades, have led to this moment for Laura. In 1975, 16-year-old Quebec resident Sharon Pryor was abducted and killed. Her body was then found in a wooded area in the town of Longale. Investigators had little more than a witness description of a suspect to go on. Over nearly five decades, they looked into more than 100 potential suspects. Finally, in 2022, they happened upon Franklin Romine, a man with a long history of criminal activity who was known to elude authorities by constantly moving between Canada and West Virginia. When investigators uncovered a link between DNA collected in 1975 and a family who had long lived in West Virginia, they were able to establish cause to exhume the body of Romine, who had died in 1982. An examination of the collected DNA then confirmed that he was indeed responsible for Pryor's murder. Knowing that her killer is no longer on this earth, and to not kill anymore brings us to somewhat of a closure. The murder of 24-year-old Rita Curran was every parent's worst nightmare. On her own for the first time while living in an apartment in Burlington, Vermont, she was sexually assaulted and strangled by an unknown assailant one night in 1971. Police were able to lift DNA evidence from the crime scene, the most viable of which came from a cigarette butt found next to Curran's body, but it never returned any matches from the National DNA Database once it became active in 1998 nor did it match any of the roughly dozen suspects in the investigation. Curran's murder eventually became the Burlington PD's oldest unsolved case. Then, in 2022, a crack team of detectives was assigned to the case to take a fresh look at the evidence through the lens of modern technology. Using newly extracted DNA and the wider scope of public ancestry records, they were able to pinpoint William DeRoos, a neighbor who lived two floors above Curran, as the killer. He died in 1986. Darus's then-wife Michelle, who now goes by a different name, confirmed that they'd had a fight on the night of the murder and that her husband had gone out for some time afterward. Darus's second wife, Sarah Hepdine, asserted in an interview with police that he strangled her on one occasion, an eerie shadow of Curran's death. It took multiple generations of Boone County, Kentucky homicide investigators to finally bring to a close the case of Carol Sue Claber, who was sexually assaulted and killed in 1976. Detective Jerry Keith had obsessively compiled information on the case, even keeping the file at his home. While the suspects he'd focused on didn't pan out, his colleague Coit Cox nevertheless credits him with helping bring the case to its eventual closure. The killer was eventually identified as Thomas Dunaway, who was only 19 at the time. Investigators zeroed in on him after securing a match with familial DNA. In the years since Claber's death, Dunaway enlisted in the army, but soon after he was arrested for possessing an illegal firearm. He also killed someone else and eventually spent seven years in prison. Dunaway died in 1990, making the finding a bittersweet one for Claber's brother Thomas. He told the New York Times that he was at least comforted by the knowledge that there had been no need to exhume her remains to resolve the crime. If Mr. Dunaway were alive, we would present this case to the grand jury seeking a charge of murder against Mr. Dunaway for the murder of Carol Sue Claber. In the sleepy coastal town of Seaside, California in 1991, 34-year-old mother of three, Vicki Johnson, met a terrible end at the hands of a mysterious perpetrator. She was strangled and smothered, and her body was set on fire in what may have been an attempt to destroy physical evidence. However, investigators were able to obtain DNA from under her fingernails. That was the only lead in a crime that offered no witnesses or other physical evidence of any kind. The case was eventually revived by a cold case task force in 2021. 
Unfortunately, the gears of justice turned just a bit too slowly in this case. The DNA led police to Frank McClure, an ex-convict who hadn't been a suspect in the investigation at any time and had no apparent ties to the victim. 46 years old at the time of Johnson's death, McClure carried the secret of what he'd done for three full decades before dying in 2021 at the age of 77, just two years before he was identified as the killer. It's just so unfortunate that something like this would happen. In 1987, 23-year-old Catherine Spacito was hiking a trail near Prescott, Arizona on what should have been a normal sunny day. Instead, it unexpectedly became the stuff of nightmares in the last moments of Spacito's life. Out of nowhere, an attacker set upon her, striking her with a rock and a wrench, shooting her through one eye and stabbing her in the head. Nearby hikers heard her screaming for help, but in the seconds it took for them to reach her, she was already dead and her attacker was gone. With no witnesses, the case went cold. But in 2017, investigators used DNA to link a different attack on the same trail to a surprising suspect. Brian Bennett was a high school junior at the time of the killing, and in 1994, he died by suicide. He was connected to several other violent crimes, including sexual assault and kidnapping. After exhuming his remains, investigators definitively concluded that DNA retrieved from the wrench used in Spazito's murder was a match for Bennett. The 1979 murder of Vicki Lynn Belk puzzled investigators for decades despite careful processing of the crime scene for evidence. She left work at the Maryland Department of Agriculture one afternoon, only to wind up dead of a gunshot wound by the side of a rural road the next day. As the years went by, that evidence was continuously re-evaluated to see if updated technology could produce results. And in late 2022, a possible suspect was found in the form of 63-year-old Andre Taylor, who was only a teenager at the time of the slaying. Taylor's address on arrest records was out of date, however, and it took a concerted effort between agencies to locate him in 2023 living in Washington, D.C. Taylor had been involved in multiple violent crimes in the intervening years, but the random nature of Belk's death had kept him off the radar of this investigation. Thanks to the DNA evidence, Taylor was finally arrested for murder and sexual assault in June 2023. In a statement, Belk's surviving family members said, We are grateful for the tireless efforts of the Charles County Sheriff's Office detectives and the forensics personnel who never ceased seeking justice on Vicki's behalf. As horrific as Vicki's death was, We've chosen to focus on how she lived. In 1974, Massachusetts resident Ruth Marie Terry departed for a trip to Tennessee with her new husband, Guy Moldavin. The plan was to visit Terry's family, but they didn't see her on that trip, and in fact, they never saw her again. When Moldavin returned to Massachusetts, he was driving Terry's car, and he informed family and friends that she died unexpectedly. Meanwhile, in Cape Cod, authorities were puzzled by the appearance of a young woman's body, mutilated beyond recognition on the sand dunes of the famous spot. The Lady of the Dunes, as she became known, had died of blunt force trauma to the head. But that was virtually all that was known about her, until, that is, she was finally identified as Terry in 2022. The police then turned their attention to Moldavin, who had died in 2002. Before marrying Terry, he had been a suspect in the deaths of a former wife and stepdaughter. In light of a re-examination of all the available evidence, authorities announced in August 2023 that they were confident that Moldavin was responsible for his wife's murder. This conclusion brought to a close the investigation into the oldest unidentified murder victim in Massachusetts history. In 1986, Garland, Texas resident Domingo Villarreal gave police a horrific story after his 27-year-old wife Barbara was stabbed to death inside their home. He said that he'd heard his wife screaming in another room, and when he came to help, he discovered armed intruders attacking her. They then fled, but not before inflicting mortal wounds on Barbara. Police ran tests on blood that was found outside the home, and it was discovered to belong to neither Barbara nor her husband. But something wasn't sitting right with detectives, and as it turned out, Domingo was lying about more than just the circumstances of his wife's death. Decades after the crime, a review of the evidence uncovered a startling fact. According to his fingerprints, Domingo Villarreal was actually an alias. His real name was Jesus Canales, and DNA typing of the original blood sample led investigators to focus on his brother, Laborio Canales. While Jesus had died in Mexico in the 90s, Laborio was alive and well. And in July 2023, at the age of 85, he confessed to Barbara's murder when confronted with the evidence, saying that he'd stabbed her over a family dispute. Barbara's brother Mark Dunderman later announced, We're happy that there's closure. It doesn't reverse any of the pain that she suffered at the end of her life and the void that we all have and have had for nearly 40 years. It didn't change anything, but, but it's nice to have closure. The 1975 death of Indiana teenager Laurel Jean Mitchell shocked the community of North Webster. Mitchell failed to turn up for a meeting with friends after leaving a church camp, and then it was discovered that she'd violently drowned, with an autopsy revealing that she'd struggled mightily for her life. Mitchell's younger sister told the New York Times in 2023, It was just a very small town, laid back. We felt safe. We came and went as we pleased in the summer, and parents didn't worry about us. Local police became interested in two possible suspects, Fred Bandy Jr. and John Wayne Lehman. 
Both of them lived within a short distance of the crime scene, and one of them drove a car similar to one that witnesses thought may have been involved in the crime. Unfortunately, there was simply not enough evidence at the time to arrest them. That all changed in the intervening years, though. On multiple occasions, a pair suggested to friends and acquaintances that they may have been involved in the crime. And in 2023, a new evaluation of DNA lifted from Mitchell's clothing finally provided investigators with what they needed. They were able to obtain arrest warrants for Bandy and Lehman, who were both now 67, and charged them with murder. Pamela Lynn Conyers was only 16 years old in 1970 when she was going to the mall to buy shoe polish for a school dance. But then she happened upon the predator who would take her life. She was strangled and asphyxiated, and her body was dumped near a highway that was under construction. Her death stunned close-knit Anne Arundel County, Maryland. And unfortunately, the physical evidence collected from the crime scene wasn't enough to point police toward any suspects, so the case went cold for decades. But eventually, thanks to the steady advances in DNA technology, authorities were able to use a publicly available commercial database and investigative genealogy to pin the crime on Forrest Williams. He was only 21 years old at the time of the murder, and he had no connections to Conyers. And in the years since, he amassed no more than a petty criminal record. Williams died in 2018, and by the time the crime was solved, no family members were left to mourn Conyers. Michael Golden, a high school classmate of hers, attended the announcement of the resolution of the case, where he offered a sad coda. I still mourn her death. You know, I, I got to be old. You know, she didn't. She's forever 16. The 1993 abduction and murder of 12-year-old Jennifer Odom in Pasco County, Florida, was a case that investigators poured their time and hearts into for decades, but to no avail. The lively young girl was abducted after getting off the school bus at a regular stop near her home. Her abductor then bludgeoned her to death and left her body in an orange grove miles away. Over the years, investigators piled up a mountain of evidence, erected billboards, offered rewards, and even successfully lobbied for the case to be featured on the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. Alas, it all remained stubbornly unsolved. But then, in 2015, they finally caught a break. DNA evidence led them to arrest a man for a very similar crime in the same area and around the same time. His name was Jeffrey Crum, and he was identified through investigative genealogy as the man who abducted and sexually assaulted a 17-year-old high school student just over a year before Odom's death. The similarities between the two cases immediately made Crum the prime suspect in Odom's murder. After a re-evaluation of the biological evidence from the crime scene, Crum, who was already in prison for the earlier sexual assault, was formally charged with Odom's killing. The abduction and beating death of eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington in 1975 as she walked to her last day of Bible school devastated the small community of Marple Township, Pennsylvania. In this case, the break came not from improved technology, but from a witness, who at the time was friends with the daughter of David Zanstra, a pastor at the Bible school. According to the witness, Zanstra had attempted to grope her during a sleepover at his house. She also recalled a former classmate having a couple of close calls with an adult who attempted to kidnap her, whom the witness suspected may have been Zanstra based on her own experience with him. Police had interviewed Zanstra at the time of the crime, but he denied seeing Harrington at all that day. Even though multiple witnesses had placed him in the area where she was abducted, there wasn't enough evidence for an arrest. But when presented with the new testimony from the witness, the now 83-year-old former pastor admitted that he'd given Harrington a ride that day. He asked her to take off her clothes, and when she didn't, he beat her to death. Upon the occasion of Zanstra's arrest, District Attorney Jack Stolsteimer didn't mince words, saying during a press conference, He's going to die in jail. Then he's going to have to find out what the God he professes to believe in holds for those who are this evil to our children. This is a man who is a remorseless child predator. The murder of Linda Fields of Racine, Wisconsin was a case that hit several frustrating dead ends before it was finally cracked. In February 2000, 37-year-old Fields was discovered strangled to death under a tree in a residential front yard. Several quality DNA samples were recovered from the scene. They were genetically identical and pointed to a single male perpetrator. But the state's DNA database didn't return any matches, and with no smoking gun, investigators had their work cut out for them. Over the years, the lead investigator interviewed witnesses, gathered evidence, and eventually zeroed in on five possible suspects, none of whom were a match for the DNA profile and evidence. In 2021, detectives took a new look at the two decades old case, this time employing investigative genealogy. After a potential match was made with a deceased individual, they began to focus on that person's still living brother and father. The brother was eliminated, so the focus turned to the father. Lucas Alonzo, an Illinois resident whose DNA was subsequently obtained by police via a search warrant. That sample was found with near absolute certainty to be a match for the one collected from the original crime scene. Alonzo was subsequently arrested and charged with the murder of Fields. One spring day in 1987, Mary Davis of Lexington, North Carolina, a married mother of two, departed the Ace Hardware store where she worked. But then she never returned. 
Her husband, Richard, soon grew concerned, and the very next day, the worst was confirmed, as Davis was found behind an area supermarket, strangled to death. DNA samples collected from the scene proved to be of no help to investigators at the time, though the case remained open. In 2022, the DNA evidence was re-examined using the latest techniques, and it generated leads that eventually led to Lexington resident Russell Wood, who died in 2013. After reviewing the conclusions drawn by detectives, District Attorney Gary Frank provided Davis's family with a letter stating that if Wood were still alive, he would have been charged with crimes including first-degree murder and sexual assault. Davis's daughter Tracy, who was just an infant at the time of her mother's death, expressed relief at the resolution of the case and offered a plaintiff memorial. I've always heard that she was kind and sweet and she had a lot of patience and she just liked people. Redford, Michigan resident Christina Castiglione was only 19 years old when she met her end at the hands of a man who would go unidentified for 40 years. In March 1983, Castiglione left a group of friends to walk home after arguing with her boyfriend. She then vanished. After eight long days, her body was discovered miles away. It was determined that she'd been sexually assaulted and strangled. DNA recovered from the scene was carefully preserved and entered into a database two decades later, though it returned no matches at the time. But thanks in part to a grant from a nonprofit called Season of Justice, the latest technology was applied to the samples in early 2022. A genealogy profile built from the samples led police to the living relatives of Charles Shaw, a local man with a troubled past and criminal history who had died in 1983. With help from the relatives, detectives were able to definitively identify Shaw as a perpetrator. The cold case was the first to be solved by the Livingston County Sheriff's Office with the assistance of DNA genealogy technology, but it almost certainly won't be the last, as the cold case team is currently putting that grant to good use by employing the technique towards four additional unsolved homicides. In 1979, police in El Dorado County, California were baffled by the case of an unidentified woman who had been beaten and strangled to death at a Lake Tahoe campground. It ultimately took more than a quarter of a century for the victim to be properly identified. Investigators on the case made public a piece of jewelry that the victim was wearing at the time of her death. This finally prompted her daughter to come forward in 2015 to identify her as Patricia Carnahan. The identity of her killer, though, remained a mystery until 2023, when a Washington state audit of its backlog of sexual assault collection kits bore unexpected fruit. The kit in question was from 1994, and it contained the DNA of Harold Carpenter, who had been accused of, though not charged with, sexual assault that year. As part of the backlog clearing initiative, the DNA from that long-ago kit was uploaded to CODIS, the FBI's DNA database, where it was matched with DNA taken from the 1979 crime scene. Carpenter was arrested in March in Spokane, and it was reported that he was to be extradited to California to stand trial for the murder. In a statement, Attorney General Bob Ferguson made a public appeal for more states to follow Washington's lead, as he said, Cases like this illustrate the need to test every sexual assault kit. Every untested kit could be a potential break in a cold case. That's why it's so important to get these kits tested, get that DNA in the system, so we can bring closure and bring justice as well. The 2011 shooting death of Cape Cod, Massachusetts resident Todd Lampley remained a mystery for 12 years, until a pair of seemingly innocuous clues pointed detectives in the right direction. Lampley was shot inside his bedroom, and police recovered a phone from the crime scene. Unfortunately, it yielded no physical or forensic evidence. It was registered in the name of Marlo Stanfield, which was also the name of a character from the classic HBO series The Wire. It took detectives some time to put this together, but once they did, the fact that a mutilated sweet potato was also found at the scene took on new significance. Investigators were never able to recover any DNA from the scene, but there was an episode of The Wire in which potatoes were used as silencers. And once it dawned on investigators that it had likely been put to the same use in the cold case, their sweet potato was examined more closely. It yielded DNA that matched Tavares Hampton, who had previously accused Lampley of being involved in the shooting death of an acquaintance in 2007 crime for which Lampley was never charged. An examination of records from an ankle monitor that Hampton had been wearing at the time of Lampley's murder placed him at the crime scene, thereby finally giving prosecutors a pretty ironclad case. When 59-year-old New Jersey resident Carol Ree failed to show up for a family trip in 2013, the last thing anyone suspected was that she was the victim of a violent crime. As her daughter Dawn Santani told CBS News Philadelphia, She was so kind and gentle and just just seems like such a weird fate for her. After going missing for four days, Reeve's body was discovered in a patch of woods near highway miles from her home. In the decade that followed, investigators kept the case at the front of their minds, confident that it would eventually be solved. And indeed, in May 2023, an arrest was finally made. The initial analysis of DNA recovered from the crime scene had yielded inconclusive results. But advances in technology eventually allowed police to zero in on 59-year-old Joseph Grizoff, who had lived near Reeves' apartment. 
He was interviewed early in the investigation and claimed that he had never been inside Reeves' apartment, but the new analysis of the DNA put the lie to that, and that was enough to charge him with murder. Police Chief David Harkins said in a statement, I'm very proud of the collaboration and teamwork of the detectives who have worked countless hours which led to this arrest today. If you or anyone you know may be the victim of domestic abuse, please contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website.